nice to see you all here. Uh, thanks uh, for being here for this, uh, uh, the talk of, uh, by Susanna uh, Loeb. Um, it's really, this is actually among uh, the sort of my favorite uh, activities in, in the sense of that we bring together colleagues from all over the uh, university to actually uh, learn about one another's uh, research. Uh, and what I see is not only is it interesting and it's fun, uh, but it actually truly builds a community that people actually come in, they lean, they like to learn uh, from uh, one another. Um, and so the series, which now is in its fifth year, um, has been like this every every single time, whether a lunch session or dinner session, always uh, is a is a full house. Uh, and it's also wonderful to see that we have some uh, past uh, speakers. There's Sohini, there's Robert. I'm trying to see if there are others uh, in the room who've uh, spoken at this uh, um, series. Uh, I know that Stephen's going to be speaking. At, we have a parallel series where faculty uh, share their research uh, with staff. Uh, and that's also been uh, really, really uh, terrific. Um, when I saw the list of people who were coming, I was not at all surprised by the incredible turnout uh, uh, because uh, today's uh, topic is not only uh, timely, uh, but it's of critical importance uh, to our nation uh, and really uh, a very important uh, policy that people are debating. Uh, it's also important for people who have school-aged children. I'm no longer in that category, but uh, many of you uh, are. Uh, and it's really wonderful um, for us, and I, I think actually really fortunate to, uh, for us to have uh, uh, one of the nation's leading scholars uh, in this area. Uh, Susanna Loeb, who will be speaking to us today about uh, supporting parents, supporting kids, uh, how we have done a bad job but can do better. Um, I, this is what I tell myself every time I see my kids. It's like I tried really hard. It didn't, you know, but maybe it can be better, and I'm still hoping uh, in their late 20s they'll forgive me someday. Um, so Susanna Loeb, uh, just to give some background, there's a little profile uh, that you all have on your seats. Uh, she joined uh, uh, Brown in uh, July 2018 uh, to assume uh, the directorship of the Annenberg Institute at a really important uh, moment in the Institute's um, uh, history. The Annenberg Institute's been around at Brown for, uh, since the 1990s. Uh, it has, uh, it's uh, focused on uh, school reform. It has had different moments uh, of activity. But what we were looking for as we were recruiting uh, a new director was a, uh, a gifted scholar who could actually help us build a uh, social science uh, institute uh, focused on uh, education reform uh, and uh, especially issues of inequality and access to high quality education uh, and then what are the sort of consequences of that inequality and what are the remediations uh, that could uh, that we could sort of uh, promote. Uh, we all know that access to high quality education determines one's life choices uh, uh, in this country but in other countries as well and so to be able to and inequality is a big issue that touches so many different disciplines um, uh, uh, on, on this campus. And the idea was, could we, in this next phase of the Annenberg, bring a director um, who would not only build ties across the university, uh, but also help uh, Brown fulfill its mission, uh, which is, of course, to use research uh, and teaching to make a difference in the world. Uh, and we are so lucky that Susanna uh, decided uh, to come here, uh, and she has hit the ground uh, running. Uh, she has, uh, in her year and a half uh, since she joined us, uh, she's worked with the Department of Education and other departments to really build, I think, a high-quality hub of research, teaching, and engagement uh, in school reform, educational reform, now located uh, in its new uh, uh, location in 164 uh, Angel. Uh, as you uh, read, Susanna came to us uh, from uh, Stanford where she was the Barnett Family uh, Professor of Education, and she was also the founding director of the Center for Education Policy Analysis, and also served as co-director of the Policy Analysis for California Education uh, Project. She is widely published uh, scholar, uh, you know, mostly in uh, scholarly journals, but also uh, several books, including her most recent book, Educational Goods, Values, and Evidence in Decision Making, uh, which was published in uh, 2018. You can read a lot more about her uh, accolades. What I uh, actually didn't know, and, and I should have known that because I'm sure I read your CV uh, uh, multiple <laughs> times, uh, that uh, she uh, embodies the kind of interdisciplinarity that I think we want so, you know, that we favor so much here at Brown, and I think what makes 
makes Brown uh, so special. So she earned a BA in political science, which is great, um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and a BS in civil engineering at the same time uh, from uh, Stanford University, uh, as well as a master's in public policy and a PhD in economics uh, from, so something for everyone, uh, uh, more or less, uh, at the University um, of, of Michigan. Susanna, it is uh, so great to have you at Brown. Thank you for being a member of our community, and please join me in thanking and welcoming uh, Susanna. Thanks for having me here today. It's really fun to be here, and I'd love to get to know the ones of you here that I haven't met. It's been really a wonderful 18 months almost that I've been here, and uh, so it's a very welcoming and wonderful place to be. Um, because I can't decide what I'd like to do, I'm going to do two things here, too. So instead of just talking about my research, I will do that for most of the time. But I wanted to introduce Annenberg a little bit, because that's really what I've been working on. So uh, I, I, did, I couldn't not talk about that. So let's see if we get this. The Annenberg Institute is on the second floor of uh, the, the old Brown office building. And uh, you should just come by and see us. So our, what, is, what are we doing? And, and Rick talked about this a little bit. Our motto is that we're pursuing education for just and flourishing societies. And we're doing that by trying to bring together diverse thinkers um, to tackle difficult problems, and to do that, we're trying to develop education leaders, which I think is a really good role for a higher education institution. We're building actionable knowledge through systematic research. We're partnering with educators and policymakers for local impact. So we're doing a lot uh, with school districts in particular. And then we're trying to encourage uh, civic discourse around education issues. So, so this is kind of our underlying goals. And I thought I would just talk about a couple of core initiatives that we're doing. Um, the first is what we call catalyzing education at Brown, and I think that's probably the, the most one of the more relevant ones. So we we run seminars, and <laughs> this thing is very small here, so I can't read it. So I have to go back and forth looking. Uh, we provide a whole bunch of research supports around education. Uh, we have undergraduate, pre-doc, and postdoc training going on, and then we have this library of opportunities. So that if, for example, you were interested in engaging in the local community and has to do with education, you can now just go online and say, I want to tutor, I want to do something in sports and athletics, and all the things that were going on will show up there. And that's just kind of an example of how we're trying to make it easier for us all to engage in what I think are some of the kind of fundamental civil, civic questions that we have and ways that we can participate in society. So we also have this wonderful undergraduate uh, fellows program. and. Uh, I just wanted to mention it. We actually got the applications and are reviewing them, so it's probably a little too late for this year. But starting next year, there'll be room for new undergraduate fellows. And it's really been terrific. They spend the whole summer. We cover their costs. They learn a lot of, of Stata or a lot of computer programming. But they engage with a bunch of uh, faculty members from around the university. This summer, we're doing some of the, the fellows joint with the economics department. And it's been it was really a, a fun way of getting undergraduates engaged in Annenberg as well. OK, so that's catalyzing education at Brown. Um, the second thing we're working on is this local impact. So we're working with RIDE, which is the Rhode Island Department of Education, as well as with the Providence School District, East Providence, North Providence, Central Falls, a bunch of the school districts here to really work on their questions. And the reason that we find this kind of local engagement so important is both because it helps us to identify what the real issues are on the ground, to uh, understand what the pressures are in getting towards the outcomes that we want, and then it does give us access to data. And once we get answers or we, we um, have findings, we can understand them better through this engagement. And then the hope is that we can also impact what's going on. And right now, we're focusing on two areas. And the first is on educators, which is really what this kind of the strength of many of the education researchers are uh, in our area. And um, that we're particularly interested in right now in how you recruit a more diverse workforce to Rhode Island and the Providence area, because it's really not representative at all of the adults, and especially not the children in, the, in uh, Rhode Island. So we're working on that. 
And then we're also interested in part, because I'm just interested in issues of values, in kind of the complete sense of student well-being. And just as one example that's kind of linked to educators too, is we just did this study, uh, one of the postdocs that I'm working with, that looks at the effect that teachers have on engaging, in students, engaging students in schools. So if you take a high school student, half of the time that they're not in class, they're in school that day, they're just skipping that class. So it's not full day absences that's really the issue. It's just that they don't like being in, in class. But some teachers are really able to get those students to come to class, and those teachers have at least as strong an effect on students' later graduation, even on their kind of taking of advanced coursework, than do teachers who improve their test scores. And those happen not to be really the same teachers. It's not that they're negatively correlated. It's just that there are some teachers who are good at test scores, and there are some kids, teachers who are good at in, engagement. And particularly for the students on the margin of engagement, those engaging teachers are really key. So that would be the kind of local impact research that we're doing. And now we're trying to figure out with uh, the districts what those teachers are doing so that, that we can spread it. So the last, um, the last of these core initiatives is what we're calling tools for the field. And that is that we're trying to come up with these kind of practical tools that are useful both for researchers, or some of the tools for researchers generally, and some uh, more for educators or parents or practitioners um, that can, can push the field. And just for, on the research side, for example, we have a repository now of uh, working papers that people from around the country are putting their working papers uh, on the Annenberg site, it was very good. So now Annenberg, at least among the education community, they know what we are because of this working paper series. But it's also a place to see what people are doing because the publication timeline is so long. And we're doing the same thing for measures of the capabilities of students. So how do you measure math? How do you measure reading? How do you measure optimism? These things that we care about in students. So those are two examples. But the one, and now I'm going to my research finally, the one that I'm going to talk to you about today is called Tips by, the Tips by Text Project. And this is developing a tool that so far we've used mostly for parents, but also we're in the process of trying to transition uh, towards using it for teachers as well in a slightly different way. And the idea is that you, if we can um, give small bits of information and easy to operationalize activities and we can deliver those over a long period of time, we can change behaviors in, in ways that are much more difficult to change in more traditional kinds of parenting or professional development programs. Those kinds of programs where they give you a book and say, oh, just do this. You know, many, I mean, we're all trained to do that stuff. Most of the world does not like to do that. And at least I'm not very good at it either. OK, so let me tell you a little bit about tips by text. So here's the premise. The premise is adults um, affect children and youth. I wonder if I can make this bigger. One second. Oh, oh well. They affect the child and youth development. So parents and teachers and principals and all these people are really key to what we want, which is for, for kids to have strong home learning or just learning environments. They vary a lot in their effectiveness. Some parents are very effective. Some teachers are very effective. Almost all of them want to do a really good job. And we know there's variation and we see good people. But behaviors are difficult to change even when we want to change. So we're starting with that. And our goal is to um, use some of the new knowledge that we have about adult behavior change to benefit children. OK. So if we think about parents, what, why do we have a hard time changing? And I think, or why is parenting difficult? I think the main difficulty is we have all these decisions to make. So we have to ma make big decisions like which preschool to send our child to. But we also have to figure out what questions to ask when they see them, what games to play, how much screen time they should have. Just keep going. Uh, what's for dinner? Dishes or re should I do dishes or should I read to them? That's a, that was a big deal for me. And choices create heavy cognitive load. And 
even these little choices, when you have to do them a lot, it's really very hard. So when I was walking over, I was thinking, what can I use as an example? And I think, okay, so and when I go shopping for clothes, for example, if I go to a big place and it's got tons of stuff, I don't get anything because I can't choose. Or if I get something, it's going to be black because that's kind of my default, right? So I just go, okay, black, I guess I can wear that. Um, and that happens to everybody. Basically, when you have lots of choices, you either turn away and don't do anything, or you do a default that is, you know, what your parents did, what your friends did, something like that. And defaults can lead to intergenerational transfers of behaviors as well. So that even when the goals and knowledge of individuals and all other kinds of resources are similar, in the face of this heavy cognitive load, we, till, we still default you know, to what my mother wears, which is black, and to what our parents did for us. Okay, so what, this, this is what I think the big issue is in parenting, but it's not the only one. Clearly resources, Clearly resources are a big deal, and basically I'm not going to deal with that. Giving parents who are poor more money is beneficial, right? So that's good, but that's just not the research here. Additional information in some cases can be useful as well. What kinds of skills do we want children to develop? What are good ways for parents to interact with them to develop those skills? For example, just having conversations is, is very important, particularly in that one to two age, and parents may not know that. So there is some kind of information that can be useful. The other, the last two, which I just wanted to highlight a little because we go after them and I think they're important, though not as important as cognitive load. The first is attention. Like in Janu on January 5th, I exercise a lot, right? But by the time it gets to April, I'm like, oh yeah, I guess I'll go to the gym kind of thing. That, that things that you have to do over and over and over again, you tend to lose um, concentration on. You get tends to, to lose attention. So it's important to kind of get reminders. And this is what all the nudge literature is about. And what we're gonna do here is more than a nudge, but a nudge is part of it. And then the final, final one is self-control. So um, one example is that it's really easy to just be on your cell phone instead of talking to your child. Or that example that I gave with dishes, like the dishes would be there, and I know I should play with my daughter or talk to my daughter, but I just want to get those dishes done because I get this kind of immediate gratification from doing that that I don't necessarily get from something that takes more effort and I, you know, maybe what th they're doing they really like to be doing, even if it's watching television or something like that. Like that. So self-control is important, and self-control is actually much harder when you've got a heavy cognitive load. So there's a, lots of cool kind of marketing research on this that shows that uh, when you have, for example, when you're given a task that requires heavy cognitive load, you're much less likely to do the things you want to do. You're more likely to eat cake than you are to eat fruit, for example, even with actually little differences. So these things add up. If you think what you're trying to do is make a million choices over the course of your child's life, these little things can actually affect each of those little choices, even if they're only f affecting them a little bit. Okay. So then we looked at parenting programs, and we noticed that they really ignore these factors. Most are one time, come in here a lecture, you've got to come to school to do it. Um, they give you these books you're supposed to read and implement, so it's too much information and it tends to be divorced from implementation. Um, the second is that it's inconvenient, you know, it often requires resources and self-control to go there at night or to kind of change your schedule in order to um, use the parenting programs that are available, and they tend not to hold attention. So they're rare events that happen one time, and then you, maybe they'll happen again, but not in that kind of uh, pace that we're used to as a, as a um, parent. Um, so some of them are better at this, like these nurse home visiting programs where they go in and they help you do something, they show you how to operationalize it, they come back, but those are expensive, you know, kind of on the order of $10,000 a family, and we don't do it at scale. It, you know, other countries do it at scale, but we don't do it at scale. Okay, so what we tried to do, to do was see if we could design a program that addressed these things and could be delivered at low cost at scale. And so we, de we designed a parenting curriculum where we provide little bits of information 
um, over a long period of time. And what we try to do is we break down the complexity of parenting into small steps that are easier to achieve, which, which by giving these activities, it reduces choice. And not in a bad way. It's not like you have to do this. It's more like, here's an option. If you're defaulting to something, it's like what's on the mannequin. Oh, OK, I can do that. And there's, there's an option that you get for that. Um, it reminds parents to interact, so it tries to hold attention. Um, and it provides kind of encouragement and support. So you do it, and the hope is that you feel good about having done it, kind of in that immediate time frame. Um, and it draws on widely used technology. It's a texting program, so it, it uh, reaches a lot of people. Um, and what's interesting is that the populations that in the past have been most difficult to reach, those that are more challenged to come into a program after school, are actually more likely to make uses of texts than everyone else. So it's really good for reaching the population that we were interested in. OK, whoops. Oh, there we go. So we did a three text message per week. This is how we started off. Monday, there's a fact where you give, them infor you give information, and it's supposed to provide some information and give you context and buy-in. On Wednesday, we give a very specific kind of activity to do, which is uh, to minimize these barriers. We do the same thing on Friday, um, and we do it for the whole school year. And because you just have to write these things and they're only 150 characters, it's very easy to put them into different languages. So we have it in Arabic, Chinese, English, Haitian, Creole, and Spanish. And parents can choose which ones they want. OK, so here's an example of one. We're not going to have to come here because there's no way I can read it out here. This is a math one. Fact, the concept of more and less is important for learning later math skills like addition and subtraction. And it helps children think about the world. Com tip. Com so the first one's Monday. The second one is Wednesday. Compare groups at home. Ask, do you have more pants or shirts? Have them check by counting. Think together about why you have the different or the same amount. So that would be an example of something you could do that's easy, that fits into your schedule. Growth, keep comparing. You're preparing your child for K, for kindergarten. During bath time, put water in two plastic cups, one with more. Ask, which has less? Can you make them the same? OK. So then we did, so we would have, they didn't get that every week, right? They got a different one, uh, literacy, math, social, emotional skills. And we did random control trials. First, we did it with school districts. So the, the first one we worked with, and the one I'll show you the results for, is from the San Francisco Unified School District. Um, but then we've also worked with uh, the Dallas in, uh, Independent School District, a set of Head Start centers, and Universal Preschool in, Calif uh, in uh, Florida. Um, we sign parents up at enrollment, and then we collect the outcomes in the spring. And then, so I'm just going to show you some of the, the outcomes of these kind of basic RCTs. So first, we ask parents like what they do with their kids, and there's of course social desirability bias here, where parents want to say they do things. They say they do a lot of things, but we still get about a 30% increase in standard deviation increase in their report, which you know to us doesn't necessarily mean they did it, but it does show something that they uh, it got a little more ingrained that they were supposed to do it. So. In one place, we were able to ask the teachers about the parents. They were blind to which parents got it. And we were able to ask them, did they come in and ask questions? Which, which of these questions did they ask you? Those kinds of things. And we actually got a finding on that, too. So we got about 20 or 25% of a standard deviation more that the teachers said the parents who received the text came in and talked to them more. Then when we look at child literacy development, we get about a 15% of a standard deviation uh, increase in literacy for the year, which is about 1.5 months. Um, and again, this is only about uh, um, 2 or $3 a family for the year. But then if we take students who start at the lower half, of the distribution, then we get more over a 30% of a standard deviation. So that's like a three months, uh, th three month gain. Um, then we just did another one where we have this kind of clean comparison. And this was in kids that didn't go to preschool. So they have even less connection. And there, the average was about 18% um, of a standard deviation. But if we just looked at first children, we get it uh, up to you know 25%. And if we look at four-year-olds, part of our problem, if, for us anyway, is it's not that easy to measure outcomes for little kids. There's a lot of measurement error involved. So if we look at four-year-olds instead of three-year-olds, where the measurement is a 
little better. Again, for this very low income population, not in preschool, it's about a 33% of a standard deviation. So these are kind of consist relatively consistent big effects. And um, one of the things that we've been trying to do is see how it varies across contexts. So we've been testing it. Now I don't have results, so this is just to say these are studies that are going on right now. But we're doing it a bit around the world. So we have one starting in Singapore. We've got one there where the kids are one in China. And we collected the data, but we don't have it back. And that's in rural China, um, which will be very interesting because it's a super different context. We've got the UK, northern UK. And then in Denmark, you know, in Scandinavia, there was a big uh, immigrant population that came in that they weren't uh, that that they hadn't been prepared for in the past. And so here, this is a program that's aimed at immigrants. And then we've got a few programs in the US. OK, so then we did some RCTs around trying to get it better. And um, the first one we asked is, well, why aren't these, why are we only hitting the bottom half? And one of the issues is basically that we are just not giving them very hard things to do. And we're kind of aiming at the lower half. And so what we did for one place, which was very painful for a different doctoral student that I have, is that we took wh what the kids knew from different assessments and we gave the parents different things each week to do based on what their kids did. And um, our outcome measure wasn't great in there. But basically, we found, yes, that if we compared the differentiated to the non-differentiated, the differentiated did one did well, particularly at the top end. So that. Um, I think there are two things going on. One, it shows that uh, the, it's, I think we, we get parents to do things. What we get them to do is actually important for what happens to their kids. And that's kind of a nice thing, because it also shows that they're probably actually reading it. It isn't just a nudge. It's what they're actually doing with some of these things that seems to matter. Um, so we did another that was one, three, or five texts per week. Five is bad, essentially. Five texts per week was too many. And we, we, it, it increased the dropout rate a lot. So it like, tripled the amount of people who opt out. And usually, that's only like 2 or 3%. But once you get do this, it's like 9%. Um, and then we saw benefits of 3 over 1, particularly for the low achieving students. Um, so that was good. We made a good call. They are here. We didn't make as good a call. Um, we wanted to know, when are barriers the right height for this? Like it could be if you give me something to do, but it's in the middle of the day, for example. I, I'm not going to remember that. The barriers for me interacting with my daughter in the middle of the day are way too high for me to do anything. But maybe a night for me is good. Weekend, I probably interact with her anyway, so it's OK. I don't really need it. But night is good for me. But for some families, weekends might be better because the weeks are just too much to do. They've got multiple jobs or other kinds of things going on. And we actually we tested weekdays versus weekends. And we found that for low performing kids, since we don't have the greatest measures of parents, we do it by the achievement of their kids, it's better for them if it's done on the weekends. So even though all the things <laughs> I've showed you are weekdays, weekends are probably better. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're trying to pictures help, but I don't know. So we're, we're adding a picture to it um, to see if that matters. So. Um, <clears throat> Main takeaways, basically, is these small bits of information and easy to operational acti uh, uh, operationalize activities uh, delivered over extended periods can change adult behavior and improve educational opportunities for students. And I think for us, it also shows that there's this room for some simple tools. I just want to end on a couple of questions that we're pursuing now. And in particular, we're interested in middle schoolers and in zero to three year olds. And I think middle schoolers are important because if you look at things like self-concept and engagement and all of those, they drop precipitously in middle school. And what we're trying to do in middle school is kind of to build a connection of trust between parents and kids, both to help with those kinds of issues that come up to reduce drug use or those the kinds of uh, negative social emotional uh, things that go on, but also to help them navigate middle school and the transition to high school, where at this point, students are having to make a lot of decisions, and we want to pull parents into that. So we've got some, we have a pilot of that going on in Texas right now. But the one I'm most excited about is actually the zero to threes. So as you can see, most of our studies is kind of on the three to four year old but uh, range. But neuroscience, of course, of course, points to that zero to three time as the most important time. 
But our education system is not set up to access uh, kids at zero to three. We are the kind of least organized developed country in terms of reaching our zero to three year olds. So what we've been trying to do is figure out how we can go about doing this. And um, the two options that I think we're, we're thinking the most about are health clinics and new states' attempts to coordinate across the different sectors. So for example, Virginia, who we're trying to work with in how, in in this by providing um, these, this kind of tool for parents and then for early childhood caregivers, they're trying to kind of reach all their informal caregivers, their um, unlicensed centers, and give them a little bit of professional development and to observe them and things like that. And we're trying to hit on with that. But I think health clinics are the most interesting one because you can get the kids at zero. And even though kind of the most disconnected families don't necessarily access preschool, they're worried about most government organizations, almost all of them use public health clinics and get their kids vaccinated. As a result, the pediatricians are a really good avenue. And that the red results, if you remember back, was our pilot in a health clinic. And so right now, with a, a pediatrician uh, in California, what we're trying to do is figure out if we can do something um, called Kinder Ready Clinics, where we provide not just this tool, but these kinds of tools that can be provided uh, easily through health services to try to reach um, as many kids as we have and, and to uh, affect change before the kids get to school and we see all these differences going on. So I think it's a really interesting question. I'm used to these kind of what are the specific tools. This is much more a question of access and how do you implement it and um, kind of a larger scale policy question, but uh, we're going at that now. So that's just an example of some of the stuff that we're doing. Come see Annenberg, and I'm looking forward to talking about this with you. Great. So we have time for questions, <laughs> comments? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you for that. It was, it was really interesting to learn what our neighbor across the street is doing <laughs> in a little bit more detail. I really liked seeing the finished product and some of the results you got from that, and especially also like seeing the slide of improving the program. I'm always curious to see what ended up on the cutting room floor, and uh, even some of the earlier messy design part of the process. Like, why text for a medium? Did you try other things? And uh, did you do any kind of what we would call bottom-up research or ethnographic research yeah. that led you to some of those early insights that put you on that path to that kind of uh, medium or um, Platform. Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. And certainly, we we discarded a lot of things. One really interesting one we discarded, and then I'll come back to how we started, is an all math program. So we did an all math program and got absolutely no effects. We put math into a mixed program, and we get positive effects on math. But parents don't want something right now that is just math. I think they don't kind of identify as, as the people to help them in math. But they will once they realize that math is like, do you have more pants or shirts? It's not like solving quadratic equations or um, those kinds of things, which is in my mind because that's what my daughter's doing in school. Um, so the texting thing is interesting. I mean, I think we, we did it initially because we had no money. And it took a lot more to do some of these videos and things like that. But we also had this sense, that I think it, it came both from uh, reading the literature and then we talked to a lot of people. So we ran focus groups in libraries, actually. You know, parents come in to, to libraries and book readings, and so we went there to test some of these things out. But videos are very hard. They're, they're the other way that people have uh, tried to do this. And they're hard because people look at a video and say, oh, but my table doesn't look like that. Or my kid isn't dressed like that. I can't do the kinds of things that are there. And there's also this like pictures are worth a thousand words. And maybe sometimes you want a thousand words and sometimes a thousand words is too much. And, and our sense is that in videos, they, turn to, they tend to be too much. It's hard. And maybe the next generation with all the YouTube videos and stuff like that will be able able to follow a video, but our sense from the population that we worked with was that they couldn't. And then another option was an app, which we kept kind of being drawn to, because if we had an app, we could actually collect some better data than we could. But um, 
Dallas, where we were working, was, was using an app for some things, and they had first a lot of trouble getting parents to load the app, and um, so they helped them load the app, and the app got loaded, but then parents re uh, reached limits in space on their phone and deleted the app, and so it's... Um, we got to texting because it was such a simple thing, but now, um, as it turned out over time, it seemed like a really good one. I think the problem with it is that you can't scaffold. So you see, we give them very simple things to do. I think many of the parents say they want something more. We've actually provided click-throughs and nobody clicks through, so I'm not sure they're right when they say they want more, but, um, I think many parents could benefit, or they could benefit particularly, let's say they have a, a child who's having some kind of specific difficulties, where do they go for that kind of information? And we would, we would love to get there, particularly once we've built their confidence on these kind of easier things, but we haven't made it there yet. So I think that's kind of the next thing, is how can you get something, this is, this is, the low-hanging fruit parents, the parents that are ready to do this, that want to do it, and they just can't get over these barriers. But there are a fair number of those out there, uh, regardless of what community that you're in. Once you want to get the harder to reach parents or the, the parents who are facing greater difficulties, I think you need to do something more. Sorry, that was a long answer. Yeah. So I want to ask about recruitment. Um, you you're basically getting the parents who think this is a good idea. So, so you're, that's you're a getting really... people in who are probably at least reasonably eager to do the things that you want them to do. The kids you need to reach the most are probably not being reached. How, do, how are you going to work with that? Okay, so let me, let me see if I can convince you that's not true. Oh, okay. okay, so the Dallas Independent School District puts this on their... Uh, enrollment form, for example, and the parents have to opt out not to take it. And we get 90, between 90 and 98% of parents are signing up for it. Um, they can do that. We wouldn't be able to, to do that as, a, as, um, as researchers, but as an educational organization, they're allowed to, to do that. We've had both opt in though and opt out um, where where we've automated it to opt in, but they could they they would have to have it as opt in, and um, that uh, we've we've kept it and we haven't lost a lot of people. So it's very easy to opt out if they say stop. We can never text them again, even in another program, and we just don't lose that many families. Well, can I just follow up and ask? Yeah. Uh, do you have any of this broken down by things like family structure? Yeah. For example, single parent families versus two parent families. Yeah. Blended families, whatever. Yeah, so one is that we have the best kind of, it, it, we don't see a difference in students, but we get the best results in terms of parents really liking it from non-English speaking parents. Where we are, it's a lot of non-English speaking parents, so it's a good chunk of them, but I think that's because the materials aren't there uh, for um, non-English speakers as much. Um, so we just, in our small pilot in the health clinics, had better parent data. So this works better for first children than it does for other children. So the first time your uh, parents are a little better. And it works better for um, everything but single parents living alone. So it works better for single parents when grandparents are there. The, because we are, this was in the Bay Area, the health clinics, with almost all... Um, immigrant families with not strong legal status, uh, there's lots of adults. As long as there are more than one adult in the household, we got better effects than a single parent family. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. How did you come up with the content and did it have to be reviewed by the school districts and stuff before these texts went out to them? Yeah, isn't that random since you see my, my background and is education in there at all? I don't know. Um, so, <laughs> so luckily there's a, there's a big research literature on this and in our first program we worked very closely with a reading specialist who was in the School of Education at Stanford, Connie Jewell, who helped us with the content. Um, and then we just review it. But for preschoolers, there are states have standards of what's supposed to be in it. So that kind of information is, is pretty clearly there. Um, but we, we did it just by drawing on experts.
but we actually wrote a lot of the texts um, and then got them re got them reviewed. Yeah, I'm curious on the differentiation. <coughs> um, yeah, kind of skills. And I don't know if I got to articulate this well, but when you have kids who are low performing, right? They're often low performing in lots of ways, and then you have these higher performers, but they're not high performer in every way. Yeah. So were you targeting skills that they weren't as good at for the parents to work on with them to so, yeah. get? <laughs> Yeah, no, we weren't that we weren't that much differentiating. So we just differentiated within the same skill. We would just have them do more complicated things. So instead of having in the first thing, instead of uh, you would just recognize a letter instead of also saying it's sound or some that that kind of thing. It would be great to. Uh, it would be great to do this in a better way than it is done. You know, you do this the first time. This is not the ideal program. And in fact, I think that's kind of what's interesting is that what I think we've shown in this is that we, when people want to do things, we can make it a lot easier than we've done to help them do what they want to do. Now, what they should actually be doing, I don't quite know. And this is really coming up in the middle school years. Like, what are we, what is the right thing to be doing there? Um, so there's a lot to be done, and I'm happy for anybody to take this and who has ideas and, and work on it, because it's um, there are lots of potential applications for it. Even when texting goes away, I don't think this is a texting program. I really do think this is this kind of little bits of information delivered in a way that we who are kind of busy in life can, can use. Yeah. Measurement challenges aside, do you guys explored how this might affect things like just parent-child attachment and relationship? Yeah, so, you know, parent surveys are really hard. I was actually, yesterday I went to um, Philadelphia to this early Head Start Center because I, um, and it was great because it makes me happy to spend, to spend the day with the kids. But they, this group has 700 of these Lena devices, which they, um, kids wear in their, uh, as vests, and it records all the interaction, and it can tell the difference between adult and, and child interactions. And they're using it because between this, I think 18 and 24 months in particular, <clears throat> but just in general, this serve and return, this back and forth kind of thing is so important. They're trying to pick that up, and they're not holding like individual teachers or anything responsible, but they're just trying to see how much of that there is in their classroom. And they have a small group of parents that they sent it home with. So I am most optimistic about being able to do this with Lena devices and we're playing with that, but we haven't kind of gotten there yet. Um, there's a group of people who do this parenting stuff that are trying to do it through surveys. And I've reviewed all those survey things, but I really think it's very, it's very hard to ask people if they do these things. So that's, that's the measurement issue. But I'm, after yesterday, I'm much more optimistic. I didn't realize they did it at quite the scale they did. Yeah. So this is a bit of an off the wall question, but um, many, many, many people have devices in their homes that are listening all the time and you know that's supposed to be, and yeah. many corporations are using that data in lots of ways. I'm wondering whether the folks at Google or the folks at Amazon are a place where you could partner and get some sort of sign-in consent to get that kind of data. I mean, I don't know, but they have access. Well, the thing that comes to mind is the sociology studies that they do, or Facebook does, that has an N, you know, an N of a billion in each community. I know. Oh, it would be great. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would, I would love to do something like that. And really, if I, if, <laughs> if I weren't lazy, or if, you know, if I hadn't, uh, if I put time into it, I think that would be a terrific way of going about it. I don't really know what to do with the fact that I can't get at the parenting stuff, because I want to, and this, this would be really good, but it does require kind of making connections and all of those kinds of things that I haven't uh, done. So just to piggyback on that question, I was just wondering because full disclosure, I have ABC Learning app and all this for my children. Yeah. Would you ever think of doing a comparative study that maybe this type of interaction that a parent has with their child, there's better like learning outcomes versus me just downloading ABC Learning or Amazon Kids, like to show that actually this this that, type that the of parent. 
children. Yeah, I think there is some research out there too that kind of tries to do this. Ariel Khalil stuff at the University of Chicago has done something with apps and then with getting parents to work with their kids on apps and shows some better effects, but I don't know it as well. But I mean, I think we that it's pretty clear that this back and forth with, with kids, with adults and kids at that young age is really important. So a few years ago, Providence, I, I don't know the details of it, but I know that Providence got a fair amount of money to do an intervention with kids around early language learning. Um, and I know, I've lost track of what happened with that or whether it's still going, but is that something that you've been, that you know about or are connected with it in any way? I don't. I haven't done anything with Providence on early childhood stuff. I've been talking uh, to Patrick Revere here about doing things in Central Falls, and so we're trying to start there. But um, I, um, uh, I would be great to find out what what they're they've been doing. I mean, I think there there's lots of interesting things going on in early childhood, particularly I think in the zero to three range, as people try to figure out how to reach kids before they get to preschool. I'll bet there are people here who must know something about it because it was a substantial program that had some legs to it. Talks. I know what oh, it's Bloomberg Mine. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, ask me about San Francisco, <laughs> unfortunately. But in a couple of years, Providence will be better at it. Yeah. What about, um, have you done any work about, so there's been some research that talks about non-cognitive skills being more important for status attainment than educational, cognitive, and cognitive ability? Yeah. Are you aware of either, are you thinking about non-cognitive skills and whether or not, uh, or if there are other texting programs that talk about non-cognitive skills? Yeah, so, so we do have uh, kind of social emotional skills for the little kids built in. Our first attempt of something for teachers was around social emotional skills in the middle school. And we piloted it in LA, um, but only with kind of feedback about how to improve it. We haven't had a large scale pilot with student outcomes. Um, I think SEL skills are a good role. Like you wouldn't want to text teachers or math teachers about math. That's like central to what they do every day. You're not going to get the kind of things that you want, but most my sense is that SEL in schools is best integrated throughout the whole day, throughout the, everything that you do. And as a result, it's a little more like parenting where the teachers are saying, I need to do well, my kids to do well in math and in um, science and uh, in reading. And then with these reminders, you can say, oh, so if I give this kind of specific feedback, if I say you can do this because I, I, I'm giving you this critical feedback because I know you can do it, if you give them those kinds of things, um, it could be useful in that way. And we got kind of positive results, but I didn't, I came here, <laughs> I didn't expand it. But we have this program and it's one I would love to push forward. Yeah. I wonder if you thought about using the platform to also nudge the adults. So like, I don't know, as it's kind of, it might sound kind of fresh, but what if you were to text a parent and say, tonight, put your phone down <laughs> and yeah. play with your kid with blocks and gross motor movements are important. Or are, are there ways to, I mean. Well, that's kind of what we're trying to do here. Instead of saying, put your phone down, we're saying play with blocks. Right. So, uh, so it is kind of, that's what we're trying to do is, is uh, work with the adults. So the kids don't get this. The adults yeah. just get this. Yeah. 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 I'm curious about whether you thought a little bit more about what to do with parents of middle school children and children going into high school that would be effective and what areas you would target. Yeah. Um, to try to uh, help them uh, assist their kids not getting to uh, problematic behaviors that seem to be so prevalent. Yeah. So, I mean, we have a bunch of things that we're focusing on, but there is kind of a literature on what uh, what parents should be doing, which we're building off of. And some of it is very simple, which is to kind of be the trusted uh, source. So even if you're not having a conversation, being there is very important. There's like this potted plant idea that if, if you're there, that's a good thing. Um, there's, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's 
one. I know I have to make myself feel better about these kinds of things too. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a problem because it, well, if you, I don't think they want you to follow them to wherever they are when they're 20. Um, there is also kind of this idea of, of kind of growth mindset, essentially, that, that you want the, the ch you want to try to develop in your child the idea that, um, that what's important is that you're trying, and if you don't get something, then you've kind of made it to the next step. You've, kind of, you've pushed yourself, and the next time it will be easier to do it. So that instead of coming down hard on mistakes, kind of focusing on the benefits of mistakes as, an, as evidenced of having tried something. So there are some of those kinds of things. But then there are kind of simple things like, um, if you're having trouble engaging in, uh, in a class, the, or if your child, find out how your child is doing in a class. And then if they're having trouble, encourage them to ask questions to the teachers, help them design those questions before they go in, because it's hard to, to do that first question. Um, even just paying attention to whether the, the child is getting sleep or not. There are things like that that we're, we're focusing on too. I think we have time for one last question, if there is one. Yeah. Well, listening to you, it's it really exciting because I wonder if there's a way to combine sort of strawberries and cream with what you're explaining is uh, taking the research you have done and applying it to local community because Ann Arbor is going to be focusing on this, right? And we have a serious educational problem here. So I wonder, and we have a very similar population here as what you described. Yes. It's low income, yes. a lot of immigrants, a lot of non-English speakers. Um, could we combine those two things and use this approach to try and improve uh, educational outcomes in local public schools. Yes. Yeah, that's that is my hope, <laughs> and I think you know this is one element. And I, I'm in some ways, I think it can be. It's nice on its own because it's so inexpensive and it's super easy to scale, and it doesn't need to be touched. In some ways, you don't need to use educators' time or anything like that. You just sign them up. On the other hand. Designed well, I think if you have an intervention, but you you know you see them. So physicians are one example where you see the kids a few times a year. It's a really nice way in between of utilizing the trust that you have in these uh, in the pediatricians to provide things there. And I think you could do that with other kinds of programs too. I'm interested in, uh, in we're interested in developing one for parents of dyslexic uh, and a separate one for autistic kids. That again, the kids need bigger interventions than that we're going to give to, but this is a way of helping kind of support that in between the more intensive programs. So that's that's kind of where we are on this as well. Great. Well, thank you so thank much. You.